Chapter Eight of Miss Philura's Wedding Gown by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When Mr. George Trimmer entered his store on the Wednesday morning immediately succeeding the Monday on which his pastor had issued his bold ultimatum, he was obviously in a very bad temper. Mr. Adelbert Small, regularly employed in the Emporium for a matter of ten years back, knew the signs and cautiously retreated to his desk in the rear of the store, where during certain hours of each day he was engaged in the bookkeeping end of the business. Mr. Small was an undersized man, with what is known as a sandy complexion and rather watery blue eyes rimmed with red, the red being a consequence of a too strenuous application to figures in the semi-darkness which prevailed in the rear of the emporium. He had been talking with the new clerk, when both men caught sight of the spare, stoop-shouldered figure of their employer through the plate-glass window at the front of the store. Mr. Trimmer was twenty minutes after his usual time, a fact which Adelbert Small had already commented upon. "'Gee,' murmured the experienced clerk, "'there'll be a hot time in the old town if I ain't mistaken in the weather signs.' He climbed nimbly to his stool, and was deep in figures when the door closed behind Mr. Trimmer. "'Good morning, sir,' said Milton Gregory, with perfect propriety of tone and manner. There are occasions when a smiling politeness acts as a species of mental mustard plaster. It is a tacit rebuke to ruffled tempers, and suggests a certain smug superiority, quite maddening to persons of an irritable disposition. Mr. Trimmer merely growled as he hung up his shabby overcoat and topped it with a shabbier hat. "'What you fellows been doing?' he demanded, as he removed the arctic overshoes he wore at all seasons except midsummer. "'We've got to do more business than we have so far this week, or I'll have to discharge both of you.' Adelbert Small wriggled uneasily upon his stool. He had heard this threat many times before, but it never failed to arouse his apprehensions. Mr. Small was a family man, with a sickly wife and two children, small by name and small all over, to quote their father's frequently uttered aphorism concerning them. Therefore his job, as he called it, was of the utmost importance. He was in the habit of prefacing most of his modest plans with the words, if I don't lose my job, or if I can hold that job of mine a while longer, and so forth. This was very depressing to Mrs. Small, who declared she suffered from an access of nervousness every Saturday afternoon for fear Adelbert would come home without his job. As for the little Smalls, they frolicked, as it were, upon the brink of a jobless future. Therefore it was that Adelbert blinked his watery eyes over the columns of figures he was adding, and nervously curled his toes behind the rung of his stool, and was silent. The new clerk, however, answered with great cheerfulness. "'Doing?' he echoed. "'Why, we've swept the store, uncovered the stock, and I've arranged the windows in the way I spoke of yesterday. Did you notice them, sir?' Mr. Trimmer had noticed the windows, dressed in a manner which would have done credit to a city shop, but he merely grunted. "'I thought trade was pretty brisk,' continued the young man with admirable aplomb. "'We had quite a run on handkerchiefs yesterday.' "'Oh, we did, eh? And you think trade is pretty brisk, huh? "'Well, you're a very smart young man, very smart and knowing. "'But you'll find yourself out of a job some of these fine days, along with your smartness. "'Then maybe you'll set up in business for yourself. "'I guess you're a little too smart for me.' "'Do you want me to leave today, sir?' inquired Milton Gregory, with what Mr. Trimmer set down as an impudent smile at his employer. Then he glanced towards the corner where his own hat and coat were bestowed, with a purposeful air. "'When I want you to quit, I'll let you know,' snapped Mr. Trimmer. "'There's a customer coming in. Get busy.' It was Miss Philura Rice, in quest of a spool of silk. She was quite intent upon a scrap of brocade whose colour she wished to match. But when the young man came forward with his pleasant smile, she gazed at him with wide, uncomprehending eyes. "'Why, what? Oh!' she stammered. "'You are surprised to see me,' 
he inquired. Don't you think it's time I went to work? Oh, but, but... Do you want purple or black? asked the young man. He had taken the scrap of silk and was turning it over in his strong brown fingers with a smile. Um, purple, I think. A ten-cent spool. When did you come? Last week, he said, holding a spool for her inspection. Is that about right? I'm coming to call soon, if I may. He smiled down into her agitated face with great good humour. It was such a surprise, said Miss Philura. I'm sure I never, never should have expected... She was fumbling in her purse, and he could not help seeing how shabby and how nearly empty it was. You haven't told me whether I may come to see you, he reminded her, as he handed her the change from a quarter of a dollar. Oh, of course. Oh, I do hope you will. And I haven't inquired, is everyone quite well? Your dear mother and... I have heard nothing to the contrary, he told her, with what a more astute observer might have set down as a slight bitterness in his voice. Then he smiled down at her reassuringly. I'm here on um, business, he went on. I'll be glad to explain when I see you. Might I come tonight? Miss Philura hesitated for the fraction of a minute. Mr. Pettibone was in the habit of dropping in over Wednesday evening, but she was determined not to be selfish. I shall be very glad to have you drink tea with me, she said, with quaint cordiality. Here you, Milt, called Mr. Trimmer, jerking his thumb in the direction of a new customer at the opposite counter. I'll come, he promised Miss Philura. It was more than an hour thereafter before the stress of business again permitted a short conversation between Mr. Trimmer and his junior clerk. Hmm. You don't want to get into general conversation with customers, said Mr. Trimmer sententiously. It ain't what you're here for, Milt, and I want you should paste it in your hat. Let the women folk do the talking, and you tend strictly to business. That's my way, and I ain't going to have it no other in this here store. You understand? Young Milton Gregory stooped and picked up a scrap of paper from the floor. He glanced at it carelessly and then tucked it into his pocket. I think you make it uh, sufficiently clear, he replied. <clears throat> Excuse me, sir, interrupted Mr. Adelbert Small with an apologetic cough, but I haven't had the opportunity before. When I opened the store this morning, I found this um, under the door. Mr. Trimmer eyed the large square envelope which Mr. Small handed him. It bore his own name in small distinct characters, and the flap was fastened with a large Christmas seal, displaying the words, Peace on Earth, Good Will to Men. Oh, kind of early in the season for that sort of thing, I thought, observed Mr. Small with a feeble attempt at a laugh. Mr. Trimmer, with great deliberation, bestowed the envelope in his pocket. He thought he detected an undue curiosity on the faces of his employees. Hmm. Get back to them books, Dell, he bade his accountant. And you, Milt, put some coal on the furnace. Left to himself, he opened the envelope. It contained several crisp bank bills, folded inside a single sheet, which bore the words, For the minister's back pay. Better get busy. A reporter from the Boston Hub will be present at the service on Sunday. Hmm, exclaimed Mr. Trimmer. I'd like to know who in creation. He paused to count the bills. Then he blinked, cleared his throat, and turned the envelope over. Hmm, peace on earth, eh? Yet there had been a distinct threat conveyed to his mind by the brief words of the unknown person who was interested in the minister's back pay. He was decidedly glad on the whole when the door opened to admit the figure of the senior deacon of the church, who was also a member of the board of trustees. Morning, George, began the deacon, rubbing the dampness from the end of his nose with the back of his mittened hand. Oh, good morning, deacon, responded Mr. Trimmer. He was still holding the square envelope with its enclosure. Deacon Scrimger's sharp old eyes detected the roll of yellow-backed green paper in Mr. Trimmer's hand. Oh, "'Collection's good, eh?' commented the deacon. He removed his striped mittens, rolled them up and stuffed them into his bulging pocket. 
Then he produced an ancient and hard-worked bandana handkerchief and blew a bugle blast. There's nothing like cold cash to oil the wheels of trade, he observed oracularly. Mr. Trimmer, all unconsciously, had divested himself of the calculating merchant. He was now Elder Trimmer, solemn and sanctified. I have just received a goodly contribution to the pastor's salary, he said in his best prayer meeting manner. The Lord is on our side. Oh, you don't say, cried the deacon, wagging his aquiline old face from side to side. Who donated it? Uh, oh, it's anonymous, Mr. Trimmer told him. Some good brother, doubtless. Uh, he stole a second glance at the handwriting on the single page. Or consecrated sister. <clears throat> he coughed as in church. Or sister, he repeated, who has chosen to heed our Lord's command in keeping the right hand in um, ignorance of what the left hand hath um, performed. It is, in short, fifty dollars. And thus encouraged, I feel... Hallelujah, cried the deacon. <laughs> Maybe the pastor will let us off at that. We don't want no publicity in our church affairs. I was talking with my wife and Sister Buckthorn yesterday. The ladies' aid will contribute twenty-five dollars. They'll take it out of their missionary fund. It seems wrong to deprive the heathens, began Mr. Trimmer. But the Methodists will get one on us if the matter's took to presbytery, interrupted Deacon Scrimger. I hear there's a good deal of talk already. I regret that our pastor should have taken such a stand at this time, murmured Mr. Trimmer. Mm, I suppose we can get rid of him and get a younger man, suggested Deacon Scrimger briskly. A young man draws better in a man of his age. Mr. Trimmer was not without certain graces of character, though these were often in eclipse. He glanced sharply from the letter in his hand to the face of his colleague. We'd have to pay up just the same, he said coldly. I don't want any whippersnapper in the pulpit. We'll have to get busy. Mr. Trimmer did not, either then or later, show the anonymous communication which had accompanied the gift of fifty dollars. But the thought of the reporter from the Boston hub remained with him. As treasurer of the board of trustees, it would devolve upon himself to make a financial statement. That report should reflect credit upon Innisfield, he was determined, and, incidentally, upon that pious person, Elder George Trimmer. End of chapter 8《ラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラ She was herself bursting with a piece of information which had only just reached her after a circuitous route through the town. Um, you ain't lived here long, have you? she interrogated the young man who was wrapping up her purchase. She thought he strongly resembled a picture she had seen in an advertisement of ready made clothes. He had the same clean shaven, square jaw, straight nose, and tall, well made figure. Miss Elector smiled into his grey eyes as she asked the question. No, I haven't, he said briefly. Then you ain't heard about the minister? The minister, he repeated. Oh, yes, Mr. Pettibone. He was going to get married Thanksgiving Day, 
But I guess maybe it won't come off quite as soon, after all. Why not? inquired Mr. Trimmer's clerk with some sharpness. There had been a note of joy in the lady's voice, which she had made no attempt to disguise. There's strong feeling in the community that he'd better resign, and I guess he's going to. But of course, you wouldn't be interested, seeing you're a stranger amongst us. Miss Pratt sniffed as she bestowed her parcel in the netted bag she carried. Then she bowed genteelly to Mr. Trimmer. Uh, I was going to stop at your house this noon to ask if you um, couldn't make it convenient to pay your pew rent, said that gentleman, motioning his clerk to retire. My pew rent, cried Miss Pratt. Well, don't I set in the singer's seat, I'd like to know. And Ma ain't been to church for more than a year. Well, if you don't want the seat any longer, give it up, advised Mr. Trimmer. But we've got to raise some money, and you're on our books for twenty-five dollars. Well, when we get our new pastor, I'll speak to Ma about it, purred Miss Elector. But we'll be candidating for a spell, I suppose. What do you mean? demanded Mr. Trimmer with considerable acerbity. Miss Pratt displayed some excitement. It's come to me straight as a string. Miss Deacon Buckthorn told Abby Whitton that Mrs. Scrimger told her that the deacon said the deacon was in here not ten minutes ago. Didn't he say we was going to have a new pastor? Not to me, no man. And didn't you tell your wife? Mr. Trimmer suddenly divested himself of his churchly manner for one thoroughly domestic. Oh, drat the women! was what he muttered under his breath. And all this time, Miss Philura was wondering whether biscuit and cold-boiled eggs cut into rounds and peach preserves with jelly roll would satisfy the appetite of the young gentleman who was going to drink tea with her that evening. He looked very hearty, she told herself, with certain misgivings. But she'd been reckless in her use of the chicken the butter woman had left on the occasion of her last visit. Genevieve Parsons had been helping make the black and purple brocade, and Miss Philura had set what she privately considered a lavish repast before the young person each day. Miss Parsons might be crossed in love, but she brought a healthy young appetite to her meals. She had not said anything about her sorrow to Miss Philura, although that lady was eagerly sympathetic. The girl sat by the window putting final touches on the brocade waist when Miss Philura hurried in, quite out of breath. I was never so surprised, she declared. The girl by the window fixed her brown eyes on the agitated face. Her sorrow had evidently got the better of her during Miss Philura's absence, for her eyelids were pink and a stray drop twinkled on the long curling lashes. Oh, you poor darling! cried Miss Philura. I feel almost wicked to be so happy when you... But you know, dear, he is perfectly safe in the encircling good, and your own must come to you. Oh, and I hope you won't mind my saying it, but it slipped out before I thought. The girl gazed almost defiantly at her would-be comforter. I see Cousin Malvina must have talked to you about my affairs, she said stiffly. Oh, please don't be angry, my dear, begged Miss Philura. I oughtn't to have mentioned it, but seeing my cousin so unexpectedly, although perhaps I shouldn't call him that, his mother was related to my mother, oh, first cousin, once removed, I think it was. But Cousin Caroline has always been kindness itself. And you don't mind my knowing just a little bit, do you, dear? The girl made no reply to this appeal. Her slim shoulders lifted slightly as she searched in a small tin box on the window sill for a hook of the right sort. In the encircling good, there is a lavish abundance of happiness for you, said Miss Philura softly. There was a pink spot on either thin cheek. Her blue eyes shone as bright as stars. I had to tell you, she went on. It wouldn't be generous to keep it to myself. Everything will come right if you will only... The 
girl faced about in her chair i don't know what cousin malvina bennett told you she said coldly i was engaged to be married and his mother well, i wasn't good enough she made it perfectly plain i saw that it was true i wasn't suitable so it's all over he went to london or germany i don't know where exactly he never wrote to me after well after i explained we said good-bye and he went away the young voice trembled slightly i've told you this because i can't bear to have people sorry for me so please don't i know i know my dear i want to be glad for you miss philura stooped and dropped a butterfly kiss on top of the blonde head i shall be glad for you i am glad this minute everything will come right you'll see how could it murmured the girl you don't know her it lacked exactly ten minutes of six o'clock when miss philura's bell jangled and miss philura herself quite pink and happy after a reassuring glance at the biscuits browning propitiously in the oven opened the door to admit mr trimmer's smart clerk looking smarter than ever in clothes which his hostess was totally unable to appreciate but which roused her to vague wishes concerning mr pettibone's ministerial wardrobe the tea-table was already spread in cosy proximity to the steady fires of the scarlet geraniums which had flowered with surprising earliness this fall and almost immediately the two sat down upon second thoughts which are often good and worthy miss philura had added to her menu baked potatoes and a dish of creamed codfish a delectable plat when properly prepared the young man was hungry there could be no doubt of that miss philura beamed with delight when he accepted his fifth biscuit now gregory she said with something of the authority of the successful hostess i want you to tell me how it happens that you are in innisfield working for george trimmer i do hope <clears throat> she coughed delicately behind her fringed napkin i hope the family has not met with reverses this she felt sure was the proper term to apply to the losses of very rich people no he said quite seriously father and mother are quite well and they haven't lost any of their confounded money i wish they had yes by george i do i wish they'd lose every cent of it oh my dear deprecated miss philura in pained surprise i i've met with reverses though pursued the young man that's why i've cut it out miss philura looked inquiringly you've cut he nodded the whole outfit i'm my own man now working for my living getting eight dollars a week and living on five what do you think of that she didn't know exactly what to think in view of his appetite he had absent-mindedly reached for his sixth biscuit and was buttering it thickly i haven't had a decent meal before since i came to innisfield and you certainly can cook cousin flora that white stuff now i'd like to see mother's chef up against that may i have some more and another potato miss philura beamed oh, it's only creamed codfish greg she told him it's bully stuff i'm going to have it every day at my house if i ever get one he heaved a deep sigh which was not all content and your dear mother uh, what does she think of your um mother supposes me to be spending money in london paris baden she thinks i'm in europe she saw me on board the colonia four weeks ago i had a first-class cabin several thousand dollars and incidentally the maternal blessing he was staring down at his plate won't you have some cake urged miss philura it isn't quite as nice as i could wish but um he leaned his elbows on the table and stared across at her do you think one person a fellow's mother say has a right to arrange his life for him according to her own ideas like bric-a-brac on a table his boyish good looks had hardened into something strangely stern 
for a fleeting instant miss philura thought he resembled the majestic person who had constituted herself the undisputed arbiter of so many destinies if you do he went on i don't i suppose i'll forgive my mother some time i shall if he paused to scowl darkly oh, the preserves twittered miss philura gently aren't quite as clear as usual this year uh, but i hope you'll um i was engaged to the dearest sweetest most innocent little girl on god's earth he went on she was oh, lord i can't talk about it but she you see i graduated in june and i had my twenty-first birthday in april i'm no baby and we'd planned to be married and go abroad together mother had always said i should go as soon as i got my degree i got it and it was come loud eh by george i worked like a dog but when i told her you mean cousin caroline yes when i told mother about it and expected the lord knows what i ought to have expected she's as hard a, as this table and he smote the mahogany a blow that set miss philura's ancestral teacups dancing oh, i beg your pardon cousin i hope i haven't broken anything but i can't think of it without getting swearing mad oh i hope not my dear murmured miss philura your dear mother she used to wash my mouth out with kitchen soap for what she called profanity he said moodily but kitchen soap isn't in it for what she's goaded me into since look here cousin i'll tell you what she did she went to see my dearest girl i had asked her to do it but i might have known better she went to see her and it's too brutal she told my darling she wasn't good enough think of that will you an innocent white-souled angel of a girl too pure and sweet for any man to look at with anything but worship and my mother told her she must give me up because oh rot it makes me sick genevieve sewed for a living and i genevieve repeated miss philura hmm, that's her name pretty isn't it but it isn't a patch on her an excited colour was coming and going in miss philura's cheeks what should she do her duty to cousin caroline loomed majestic and threatening like that lady herself in irate mood as she gazed across the table at the face of her young kinsman oh my dear gregory she murmured gently how very extraordinary oh, but you aren't eating anything the young man paid no sort of heed to the agitation of his hostess she's in this town somewhere he went on i wormed that much out of her mother but how could you in london you said or, or was it east boston i'm so surprised you know to think i didn't stay in london he explained i allowed mother to ship me off for i wanted time to mull things over i came back directly and went straight to see genevieve but she was gone and she'd made her mother promise not to tell where she was she's proud the poor darling and when my mother oh confound it i can't talk about it but i want you to help me find her i've ransacked the town and i can't get any trace of her he fixed compelling eyes upon miss philura that's why i went to work for trimmer i thought she'd be sure to come there to buy something and besides i wanted to show mother and father i could earn my own living and hers too you know everybody around here cousin philura and you must have seen her she's tall and slender her eyes are brown and her hair oh, you ought to see her hair such a lot of it and all shiny and curling i've got a bit of it here he produced a wallet from out a pocket of which he took a folded paper there he said lifting a long strand of yellow hair from its wrapping did you ever see anything like that fine and soft and lovely it's like her oh yes yes indeed i am so interested dear gregory oh and isn't that the doorbell pray excuse me while i answer it it was as might have been expected the reverend mr pettibone who craved admittance 
Miss Philura heaved a deep breath of relief as she looked into his strong, tranquil face. "'I'm so very glad you've come,' she whispered, as he stooped to kiss her. "'Really, I, I couldn't think what to do. My cousin is here, or perhaps I should say my distant relative. Cousin Caroline always speaks of me in that way, and so, of course—' Somewhat breathlessly, she ushered him into the little sitting-room, where her guest stood moodily staring at the coals in the base burner. "'My distant relative, Gregory Van Duser, Mr. Pettibone,' she managed to say. Then, while the two shook hands, looking squarely into each other's eyes after the fashion of men, she withdrew to the kitchen to gain composure. "'Oh, Morty, dear,' she whispered, as she recklessly bestowed upon the cat the remainder of the creamed codfish, which would have done perfectly well for her own breakfast, to think I know where she is this minute, and it is in my power to make two young creatures perfectly happy, and to foil Cousin Caroline as well. I'm afraid I can't help doing it, and I am so glad. But I shall ask him. He'll know whether I ought to or not. But Providence, which is not always hostile, whatever some people may think, and which indeed appears to interest itself particularly and most benignly in the loves of young and innocent beings, asked no odds of the Reverend Mr. Pettibone, nor yet of Miss Philura. Gregory Van Duser, very stiff, though polite, towards the elderly person who had interrupted his conversation with Miss Philura, presently took his leave and went swinging off down the street at a great pace. At the corner, just beneath the ice-bound branches of a great elm, a shadowy figure had paused and was in the act of introducing a letter into the narrow mouth of a post-box, when the arc-light struck a sparkle of gold from the bent head. Young Gregory's heart leaped to his throat and to his lips. Genevieve! he cried. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 Miss Malvina Bennett stood rubbing her chilled fingers over Miss Philura's cook-stove, from which that little lady had just taken a pan of hot water for her breakfast things. Miss Bennett wore a shawl over her head, and she had not removed from the front of her dress the faded pincushion, fashioned in the shape of a heart and bristling with pins and needles. "'I suppose you've heard about Genevieve,' she began. "'She said he was here taking supper with you last night, and to think of his being a relative of yours.' "'Oh!' cried Miss Philura. In her agitation, she almost dropped the cracked teacup, which she had used for fifteen years, drinking her tea and coffee lukewarm out of consideration for its delicate condition. "'Oh, but I didn't tell him. I couldn't think what my duty was to Cousin Caserine. But I asked Mr. Pettibone, and he said I was settin' by the stove, reading that continued story in the Fashion Monthly, chimed in Miss Bennett. Genevieve, she'd been writing a letter to her ma. A better girl than Genevieve Parsons never lived, if I do say it, being sister-in-law to her ma's own sister. Cousin Malvina, she says, I'll just run out and slip this letter in the box. I'll be back in a minute. Oh, put on your coat, I says. It's growing cold. Then I forgot all about her, having got to that point in the story where Lionel proposes to Lady Clara, and she says she's always loved him from a child. Well, as I say, I'd completely forgotten Genevieve's going out to the post-box, when all of a sudden the clock struck nine. And I says, whatever's got Genevieve? Up I jumps and put on my shawl and runs out to the letter-box. There warn't a soul in sight. Oh, my, but I was scared. Thinks I, she's been brooding over her trouble so long, she's out of her mind, maybe. Well, I started for your house, hard as I could go, leaving my front door wide open. Well, of course, the wind blew in and broke the lamp chimney. I found the glass on the floor this morning. Oh, lucky it didn't set the house on fire. Then I see Genevieve. She was coming down the street with a man. Goodness, wasn't I flabbergasted? Well, they didn't see me but just dawdled along as if it was June. They went right by me. Beans they took up with each other, they didn't see me no more as if I was an electric light pole. When they got to the house, they stopped inside the gate, and right in the shadow of the big lilac bush, he kissed her. 
I heard it. Oh, then I took a hold. Genevieve, I says, just like that I says it. She give a little scream. Oh, cousin Malvina, she says, I thought you were. Yes, I says, you thought I was safe in the house by the base burner reading a love story. But I ain't, I says. I'm right on the job of looking after you, I says, same as I told your ma I would. Then he spoke up. I'm Gregory Van Duser, he says, and Genevieve is going to marry me right away. Oh, Greg, she says. Yes, Genevieve, he says. You promised, you know. <sighs> Miss Bennet paused for breath. Oh, dear, dear, murmured Miss Philura. Oh, ain't you glad? demanded Malvina Bennet. You'd better believe I be. You wouldn't know Genevieve this morning. When I come up to the sewing room after doing up the breakfast dishes, there she sat, as pretty as a pink, singing kind of soft to herself. And what do you think she was doing? Miss Bennet paused dramatically. Well, I'm sure I don't know, murmured Miss Philura, wrinkling her forehead. She couldn't help thinking of cousin Caroline Van Duser and feeling like a guilty conspirator as she pictured to herself that majestic lady's wrath and consternation at the swift undoing of all her carefully laid plans. You couldn't guess in a hundred years, not if you was to die for it. Oh, she wasn't crying, hazarded Miss Philura. Oh, with joy, I mean, she amended quickly. Crying? Crying, sniffed Miss Bennet. You ain't got much imagination, Philura. No, she wasn't crying. She was a sewing purple buttons all down the back of Miss Buckthorn's red waist. Oh, really? interrogated Miss Philura, weakly endeavouring to banish the stern visage of Mrs. J. Mortimer Van Duser from her mind. And she'd sewed them on good and firm, too, continued Miss Bennet with a cackle of laughter. I'm going to send her over here to finish your black and purple this afternoon. I can't bother with her. And say, Philura, that reminds me. I'll take them white goods right home with me now and get the dress cut out and ready to fit. Oh, that's really what I come for. Oh, the white goods, repeated Miss Philura in a low voice. Oh, you mean, um, I mean your wedding dress. I ought to have started on it before, but I wanted to get the shop kind of cleaned up and work out of the house before I begun on yours. Oh, oh, but I, well, the material, um... Miss Philura's voice died into silence. She polished the knife she was holding with tremulous fingers. Ain't you got the goods yet? Almost screamed Miss Bennet. And the wedding only a week off come Thursday. Oh, why, Philura Rice! Oh, I, I believe it is on the way, faltered Miss Philura. Then she straightened her small figure confidently. It is on the way, she repeated firmly. It will be here soon. I should hope so if I'm going to make it, said Miss Bennet. I don't want to throw it together. And I plan to trim it with some of that new kind of trimming made out of the goods. It's pleated on both sides. The pleats turned opposite ways. Oh, it's awful stylish. But it takes time to make it. It must be pretty. Miss Philura spoke with a sweet aloofness, which drew Miss Bennet's faded eyes to her face. Well, I must say, she syllabled, you don't seem to worry none about your goods being delayed. Some folks would be wild and flying round like a hen with a head cut off. Miss Philura smiled a sweet, faint smile, which somehow made Miss Bennet think of a pictured angel in her copy of Pilgrim's Progress. I am not at all worried, she said. I am sure, sure it will come in time. End of chapter 10「Eleven of Miss Philura's Wedding Gown by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. J. Mortimer Van Duser sat before the fire in her dressing room, feeling quite at ease in a carefully relaxed position. Even her jewelled hands lay supinely amid the silken folds of her negligee. Mrs. Van Duser was resting after a strenuous afternoon at the Ontological Club during the course of which she had presented a pregnant paper on 
parental influence as related to the law of karma. An earnest discussion had followed the reading of the paper, with Mrs. Van Duser as its pivotal point, so to speak, or, to quote Dr. Orilla Robinson Cobb's words, its radioactive centre. Mrs. Van Duser had found it all exceedingly uplifting, yet even her robust, well-nourished body demanded its dues of rest and relaxation, and Mrs. Van Duser was not one to push ontological theories to the point of what she privately considered folly. There were many worthy persons interested in the mental cult of which Mrs. Van Duser had become a shining exponent, who had no social responsibilities, and who were not burdened with an excess of this world's goods. Such individuals could scarcely realise the weight of duties which devolved upon Mrs. Van Duser in her double role of radioactive centre of the ontological club and undisputed leader of that august inner circle of society which constituted the veritable hub, written, of course, with a capital letter, of that mighty wheel of progress called Boston. Mrs. Van Duser made it a point to relax. She justly objected to the metaphysically false term devitalize, particularly when dining out, the dinner to be followed by an equally important function in the shape of a great reception at the home of a woman who attempted, but without success, to rival Mrs. Van Duser, both socially and ontologically. As everyone knows, one must think of nothing at all when in a condition of relaxation, and, if attainable, there is nothing more potent than this quiescent state to remove wrinkles and other signs of advancing years, both a false concept of the carnal mind, or to restore vigour and brilliancy to the mental powers. Mrs. Van Duser wished particularly to look and feel at her best on this evening, for which Fifine, her maid, was already laying out the newest and most successful of her Popham Paris creations. But her mind, with annoying persistence, kept harking back to the discussion of the afternoon, and with the variously conflicting views of the law of karma as related to the subject of parental responsibility, came the thought of her own and only son, Gregory. His name was Milton Gregory Van Duser, after two of his great-grandfathers. Mrs. Van Duser was not one to grow lax in the matter of great-grandfathers. Milton Gregory had shown alarming tendencies of late, a distressing affair with Miss Popham's seamstress. But right at the crucial point in the young man's career, parental influence had come into play. Mrs. Van Duser breathed deep contentment as she rapidly reviewed her own part in the invincible workings of karma. The girl had been amenable to the higher voice of reason. There had been no foolish tears, no recriminations, except, of course, on the part of that very common person, her mother. On her own plane of life, Genevieve Parsons had acquitted herself with credit. She had actually approved the girl's self-control, and her spirit, too. It had been admirable. And she had saved her son from a frightful mesalliance, by the promptness and unswerving firmness with which she had performed her own duty in the matter. Mrs. Van Duser had not once alluded to her own recent experience with cosmic law at the club that afternoon. Such a course would have been indelicate, but the consciousness of her success had lent a serene and compelling majesty to her mien and utterances as she dwelt upon the basic relations of motherhood to karma. Dear Gregory was enjoying himself with well-bred persons of his own class in a country house in Kent. Mrs. Van Duser's social circle was wide, its circumference even including a few titles on the other side of the water. She thought now, with a smile of maternal pride, of her darling Gregory's ingenuous good looks, of his faultless wardrobe, of his prospective millions, all of which she knew would be duly appreciated by the noble but impoverished dowager countess of medhurst why should she not possibly within a few months be introducing to select boston circles my daughter lady clara van duser she could almost see herself and the tall plain but very aristocratic english girl who had so far remained unplucked upon the ancestral tree Dear Gregory must seize the brilliant opportunity which lay within his easy reach. She found herself 
quite rigid and tense in her chair with the mental effort of transmitting her ideas telepathically to dear gregory then fifine appeared at her elbow bearing a tray with a cup of bouillon which her mistress always partook of just before dressing mrs van duser aroused herself to take the cup from the maid's hand has mr van duser come in yet fifine she asked and are there any letters oui madame mr van duser is in his dressing-room madame replied the girl i shall ask parkins for the letters mrs van duser seldom asked for her mail before dressing for dinner it was her habit to examine it by the cold light of morning in an apartment devoted to correspondence and the higher pursuit of literature as embodied in various club papers on a wide variety of themes but to-night she wanted to hear from her son darling greg she apostrophized him mentally had he made the acquaintance of lady clara hercombe was karma going to be kind she willed that it would be but there was no letter from dear gregory perhaps it was too soon to expect one after his cablegram announcing a safe arrival in liverpool she glanced carelessly through the heap of envelopes bills invitations letters from needy persons and here was one from innisfield the rather unformed and timid hand announced it unopened as coming from philura rice mrs van duser laid it upon the pile of unopened envelopes relegated to her later consideration surely philura rice could have no adequate reason for further addressing so distant a relative as mrs van duser a letter as that majestic person occasionally informed certain presuming and of course needy persons of her acquaintance a letter which is neither necessary nor agreeable is in effect an unwarrantable intrusion not less so indeed than the rude pushing in of an uninvited guest mrs van duser had not invited correspondence on the part of philura rice beyond those suitable acknowledgments of her bounty which reached her from time to time as occasion required she continued to eye miss philura's modest letter with a stern and rebuking gaze philura deserved and should listen to the aphorism concerning uninvited correspondence at the earliest opportunity for the present her letter should remain as it deserved unread and unnoticed and yet do insensate letters emanate their information like ronchon rays piercing the futile defences of enfolding paper and sealed envelopes what was there about that small oblong envelope of yellowish white paper addressed in faded ink in a timid unformed hand which again and yet again drew the reluctant gaze of the great lady and which finally impelled those jewelled fingers to open it in point of fact mrs j mortimer van duser having finished her bouillon handed the cup to her maid and reached for miss philura's letter dear cousin caroline she read you may imagine my surprise and pleasure at seeing dear cousin gregory what murmured mrs van duser arching her brows and majestically replacing her eyeglasses the woman must have lost her mind he is looking very well and i had the great honour and pleasure of entertaining him at tea on wednesday absurd commented dear gregory's mother had she not received a cablegram scarcely two weeks ago announcing his safe arrival in liverpool how then could he be taking tea with philura rice in innisfield of course cousin gregory has written you of his intended marriage which he tells me some sort of inarticulate sound burst from mrs van duser's lips at this point she read the remaining words of the letter with a single comprehensive glance then she rose to her feet her wonted majesty of deportment giving place to haste and agitation fifine she called sharply my travelling dress and motoring wraps and tell parkins to order the touring car at once oui madame already the limousine waits i said the touring car it makes better time quickly girl my high-laced shoes oh, that artful designing creature after all my pains she must have mrs van duser 
was herself pulling open bureau drawers and placing various toilet articles in a small travelling bag as the latter unintelligible word fell from her lips five minutes later she was being hooked into a broadcloth gown of severe and uncompromising lines when the door opened and mr j mortimer van duser stood upon the threshold he was in full evening dress and he held an open letter in his hands for an instant he gazed in astonished silence at his august consort who appeared to have suddenly lost the dignity and poise for which she was so justly celebrated my dear caroline he said dubiously may i inquire mrs van duser faced him twitching herself out of the hands of the curious maid you may go fifine pack some sandwiches and a thermos bottle of hot coffee i shall not wait to dine but my dear expostulated mr van duser coming into the room and closing the door behind him what does this mean surely you john cried mrs van duser with an alarming wildness in her eyes from which the gold-rimmed glasses had fallen like scales as it were john i have just had a letter from philura rice and she says gregory is in innisfield and he's going to be married to that seamstress but i shall save him yet um would you mind sitting down uh, quietly and um sitting down quietly did you say john i wonder at you i shall go to innisfield and bring my poor boy home with me nothing shall prevent me but my dear i must insist when john van duser spoke in that tone which it must be owned had been seldom of late to his wife at least he was sure to be obeyed mrs van duser paused in the act of tying a motoring bonnet under her massive chin and gazed at her husband her eye caught sight of the familiar handwriting on the sheet which he was deliberately unfolding has he has gregory written she asked if you will take that thing off your head and sit down quietly i'll read what he says was mr van duser's reply mrs van duser sat down upon the extreme verge of a chair in a rigid and uncompromising attitude she did not remove the motor bonnet you are not said mr van duser going to innisfield tonight there was nothing controversial in his tone but an immense though calm conviction oh is it too late john too late yes my dear to my way of thinking it's gone beyond you oh married already philura said oh she actually had the impertinence to ask us to stop with her if we came as she hoped we would to greg's wedding to that artful designing be careful my dear you're talking about your future daughter-in-law mr van duser warned her he was actually smiling john how can you demanded his wife if it is not too late i can and will prevent sit down carrie sit down now let me read what the boy has to say for himself and without further preamble he began to read but unluckily in a tone so low that fifine flattening her small pink ear against the keyhole could scarcely hear a word oh, mon dieu she cried when describing the scene below stairs to a circle of admiring auditors never have i seen the madam like that she sit down when he say sit down she keep quiet when he tell her keep quiet she listen to him without words oh, mon dieu it is a miracle in his carefully modulated voice john van duser was reading his son's letter to the mother of his son gregory had written on this wise in a dashing hand and with great extravagance in the use of ink which here and there exploded in splatters and blots dear dad read john van duser i am writing to you instead of to mother because i believe you will understand me better than she will at any rate i can and will speak to you as man to man 
when mother shipped me off to europe i suppose she thought of me as a small boy caught stealing jam in her preserve closet all she had to do was put me to bed without supper and lock the closet door i let her think so for i wanted time to cool off and to let my darling girl get over the hurts mother had inflicted upon her she at least had no idea that she was stealing anybody's preserves so i went to liverpool of course i came back directly and i found her and myself too i think we're to be married tomorrow at cousin philura's she's a brick genevieve and i both love her and so is her minister he demurred a bit about marrying us but when i had convinced him that we were both of age and knew our own minds he consented now don't imagine that we're going to come home to be taken care of we're going to live right here in innisfield it's a bully little place and we both like it i'm going on working in the trimmer emporium i get eight dollars a week and i'll jolly old trimmer up into making it ten and besides there's the five hundred a year from grandmother's bequest we'll have no trouble getting on i hope you and mother will come to see us married i'd feel better about it and so would my darling girl but whether you will or not tomorrow we'll find your affectionate son gregory van duser the happiest man alive there was a silence which could be felt in the room as john van duser read the last words of his son's letter he folded the sheet and returned it to its envelope i telegraphed our congratulations he said slowly his eyes on his wife's rigid face End of chapter 11《Chapter 12 of Miss Philura's Wedding Gown by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Van Duser seemed to come to life at this. Our congratulations, she repeated. Our congratulations, indeed. Oh, no, John, I must decline to enter into any such collusion, even with you. I can never. Mr. Van Duser drew a chair to his wife's side and deliberately passed his arm about her substantial waist. He was calm and smiling. Now, Carrie, he began, I don't want you to make a fool of yourself and I'm not going to allow it. His tone was pleasant and his grey eyes were actually twinkling. But Caroline P. Van Duser was interiorly convinced of the truth of his words she answered him in the deepest most rotund tones of her platform voice my dear john she said majestically i think you forget yourself these words addressed to any other individual would not have failed of their result a blighted human being would have slunk one uses the word advisedly slunk quietly and unobtrusively away from the jovian glance of caroline p van duser's eyes and blessed the opportunity of so slinking but john van duser took not the slightest notice of his wife's remark instead he tightened the clasp of his arm about her waist and said quite simply and unaffectedly i never told you before carrie but i am going to now my mother didn't want me to marry you she set up quite a row about it, in fact. He appeared to relapse into reverie. What? stammered the lady in the motoring bonnet. Your mother objected? Either the idea or the heat of the room appeared oppressive, for she untied the mammoth structure of fur and velvet and cast it from her. That's right, Carrie, Mr. Van Duser said kindly. Better take your coat off, too. I don't believe it, cried Mrs. Van Duser. Wasn't I a peabody? Oh, you were certainly born of that illustrious name, Mr. Van Duser conceded. But you had no money, while Abby Decker had four thousand dollars in her own right. Enough to buy a house with, as my dear mother faithfully pointed out to me, in season and out of season. Abby Decker? repeated mrs van duser abby decker why 
John, she... I didn't love Abby Decker, he told her. And I did love Carrie Peabody. I had it out with my mother along that line, and I won. I told her I was poor, but I didn't intend to stay so. That I didn't need Abby Decker's four thousand dollars, and never should. But I did need, and would have, Carrie Peabody. But, John, your mother never so much as hinted anything of the sort to me. I always thought... You always thought yourself a most welcome addition to the family. Exactly so, my dear Carrie, put in John Van Duser. My mother was a sensible woman in the main, and she knew me well enough to understand her duty toward you. I guess she wasn't sorry in the long run. Recalling the pampered old lady, swathed in costly furs and sparkling with the diamonds she loved, Mrs. Van Duser silently agreed with him. "'But, John,' she said, this time without a trace of her platform manner, th "'this seamstress is a very ordinary sort of person, and her mother—' She finished with an undisguised shudder. "'I went to see Mrs. Parsons today,' her husband said slowly. "'Greg's letter came by the morning post.' And I've been rather, well, busy since. To tell you the truth, Carrie, there isn't a shadow of anything derogatory against the girl. They're quite poor people. So were we. Don't forget it. The girl has a fair education. She is beautiful, industrious. And the mother told me there was a Peabody cousin somewhere back on the father's side. And his great-grandfather's brother-in-law uh, was a Winthrop. So... There you have it. Greg loves her, and he's going to marry her tomorrow, whether we're there with a blessing or not. If we're not... John Van Duser paused to eye his wife fixedly. To his astonishment, he saw not the Mrs. J. Mortimer Van Duser, the august partner of his later years, the radioactive centre of various clubs and boards of management, and foremost in the steadily increasing ranks of fashionable suffragettists. No. All these majestic and truly awe-inspiring attributes appear to have dropped away like the motor cloak which lay upon the floor. What he saw was a rather stout woman, past middle age, but looking every inch the mother of his son. Her eyes sought his own appealingly, almost humbly. Oh, if, if we don't go, you think Greg... We should lose him, he said, and really, my dear, a beautiful daughter, distantly related to yourself and the Winthrops. What couldn't you make of her? Mrs. Van Duser heaved a deep sigh. Her eyes became reminiscent. Her manner, she mused, was really distinguished. I thought so at the time. And her figure, properly gowned, well, yes. John Van Duser drew her into both arms and kissed her on hesitating lips. That's my sensible Carrie. I knew you'd see it. We'll go down tomorrow and dine with Filiora after the young folks have gone on their honeymoon. Mrs. Van Duser lay supinely against his shoulder. I don't seem able to resist anything, even to dining with Filiora Rice, she said weakly. But, John, surely we can't allow Greg to live in Innisfield and go on working for that Bimmer person? Small shopkeeping is so vulgar, and the poor things couldn't exist on the absurd figures Gregory mentioned. Oh, yes, they could, asserted John Van Duser cheerfully. We lived on less, and you did the cooking and washed the dishes. My word, I'd like one of your pies occasionally now if I could get it. But I'll tell you, Carrie, I've looked into that trimmer business. I found the proprietor a decent fellow very much in need of capital. He's got a fair start over all competitors, and in the end I decided not to make Milt one of them. <laughs> he paused to chuckle to himself. Milt? 
inquired his wife, sitting up and beginning to replace her loosened hairpins. <laughs> That's what Trimmer calls Gregory, he told her. Here, you milt, run down and put coal on the furnace, he quoted. It won't hurt him, not a bit of it. And he knows it, the young rascal. I could bring her out this winter, said Mrs. Van Duser. And if Gregory wants to work, why not take him in with you? John Van Duser smote his knee with his flattened palm. Let him go his own gait, I say, Carrie. It'll make a man of him as nothing else will. And they need to be alone together, in their own nest. Just as we were, my dear, in what I sometimes look back to as the happiest days of my life. Mrs. Van Duser arose to the full height of her majestic figure. John, she said solemnly, I shall teach Gregory's wife how to make pie crust properly. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of Miss Philura's Wedding Gown by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Happily unaware of the crucial hour upon which depended much of their future peace and happiness, young Gregory Van Duser and Genevieve Parsons sat in Malvina Bennett's dingy little sitting room, with its base burner, its centre table covered with a chenille table spread, its crayon presentments of departed Bennetts and its kerosene lamp, illumining the blonde head of Genevieve, drooped over the white stuff in her lap. There had been no question whatever as to what Genevieve should be married in. "'You are going to stand up in a white dress, Genevieve,' Malvina Bennett had said. "'I can throw it together in two jerks of a lamb's tail. "'And anyway, Philora Rice's goods ain't come yet. "'I'll bet she'll have to be married in her black and purple.' Miss Bennett had marched straight to the Trimmer Emporium, where she had cheerfully expended the whole of a ten-dollar bill on breadths of shimmering white silk and several yards of the useful lace known as German Val. It was upon this creation that Genevieve was putting certain deft Parisian touches learned of Miss Popham. "'I wish,' said Gregory fervently, "'that you'd put away that sewing and look at me.' Genevieve looked at him over the airy stuff in her lap. Demure dimples played about her lips. She looked as distractingly lovely as a beautiful girl may when sewing her wedding gown in the presence of the man she will marry on the morrow. Gregory promptly lost his head, with results which may be imagined. Couldn't Malvina finish it, he begged. She couldn't finish what I'm doing, the girl told him, and exhibited with pride the embroidery she was setting here and there upon the garment. He felt in his pocket, and presently produced a piece of yellow paper. I want you to see father's telegram. You see, everything's all right, dear. She read the scrawl, a sweet gravity on her young face. I was afraid your mother would never forgive us, she said. But it says, hearty congratulations from mother and self. We'll be with you tomorrow. He sent it right off the bat, exulted Gregory, soon as he got my letter. I tell you, my dad is a brick. So is mother when you come to know her. But I'll confess I was a bit surprised to have her come around without a protest. Her swift glance warned him to forbear. He had been about to confide to her the maternal ambitions concerning Lady Clara. Instead, he said... Shall we keep house or board when we come back? Oh, keep house, of course, she told him. I can do everything. He gazed at her with adoring awe. We shall only have what I earn and grandmother's money. It won't be much. Do you suppose we can do it? What do you say, Genevieve? She cast him a delicious glance of patronage over the white stuff in her lap. I'm used to being poor, even if you aren't. We shall have everything we need. Have you a piece of paper? He felt about in his pocket and produced a half sheet of letter paper, folded once across. Hmm. Put down first, rent, twenty dollars, she commanded. He gazed at her incredulously. 
Malvina only pays seventeen for this, she said crisply. And we can't afford more. All right, he agreed. I'd rather live here with you than anywhere else without you. Now what? I know you'll be hungry and want a lot to eat, but we'll have a garden and some fruit trees, she went on, a little pucker between her brown eyes. So we'll say food forty. You mean forty a week, eh? Yeah, I guess that's about the figure. I mean a month, she corrected him, with a gentle superiority born of experience. Then we'll have forty left for clothes, fuel, amusements, church, travelling, and, well, everything else. Little things one doesn't think of, you know? Contingencies, murmured Gregory, setting down the forty dollars in his meagre row of figures and eyeing it contemplatively. Then he passed the sheet over to the girl, who surveyed it, her pretty head on one side. We shan't have a bit of trouble on that, she asserted hopefully. She turned the bit of paper over and glanced at the other side. What? What? The... He was looking over her shoulder, and incidentally dropping an occasional kiss on her bright hair. Oh, that, he said. It's a scriptural curiosity. I picked it up in the store the other day. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want ten yards of white silk with linings, read the girl. Craig, it's a shopping list. Oh, read me the rest, he urged. Perhaps you'll tell me what it means. <clears throat> Two white petticoats. I'd like one to be trimmed with an embroidered ruffle, she obeyed him. Four pairs of good stockings, one white pair, please. Three NGs, one very pretty, trimmed with lace. A warm cloak, I'd love to have a fur collar on it. And thank you for everything. All things are mine. Isn't that a unique document, Gregory demanded. And what, if one may inquire, is an NG? I've always translated that particular combination of letters into no good. But it doesn't appear to work out when trimmed with lace. But Genevieve was not even smiling. Instead, something very like a mist dimmed her bright eyes as she looked up at him. Oh, Greg, she said, her voice vibrating between tears and laughter. Don't you understand? This is a shopping list, but it's not meant for your eyes nor mine. That dear little Miss Valura wrote it. It's her handwriting and her letter paper. I've seen both. Well, he commented stupidly, why should my dear old cousin mix her metaphors in such a remarkable way? Isn't that first line out of the Bible? it is, Greg. She hasn't any money, poor dear, to buy these things. So she... He grasped the idea without further elucidation. By Jove, he cried, staring at the paper. It's a draft on the encircling good. Is that what you mean? She talked to me about it, murmured the girl. She said you were in it, the encircling good, I mean, and that everything would come right if I only believed. And, oh, Greg, I didn't believe anything could change your mother after what she said to me. But something did, you see. And we are so happy. I'm blessed if I won't play the part, declared young Gregory some moments later, during which no embroidery stitches were added to the wonder in her lap. Oh, you mean? I'll honour the draft. You buy the things, dear. You know what she'll like, and we'll give them to her. The girl shook her head. Oh, I shouldn't like her to know we'd seen this, she said slowly. Besides, we don't know exactly what she'd like. The cloak with the fur collar. It would have to be fitted. Well, suppose I shove some money under the door. That's a bully way to do it when you can't come right out with it. Just seal it in an envelope and... The bride-to-be suddenly caught his eager face between her two hands. "'I have it, Greg,' she cried. "'We'll rent Miss Fuliora's cottage. "'She'll be going to the parsonage to live and won't want it any more.' "'It's a great little place,' he approved. 
apple trees in the back yard and a hen house oh i'll dig the garden all right and you shall egg on the hens to furnishing us with lots of custards and omelettes we'll do it and i'll pay six months in advance and that'll take care of that blessed little woman's wants end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of miss philura's wedding gown by florence morse kingsley this librivox recording is in the public domain miss philura never forgot that particular saturday the one just before her marriage the rev silas pettibone for on that day several of god's purposes which had long persisted in the bud suddenly unfolded before the little lady's astonished eyes the day began early long before the light in fact for the house must be swept and dusted and scrubbed and polished as never before in honour of the wedding which was to take place under its roof that day to think of dear gregory she mused and that lovely genevieve how happy they will be and cousin caroline and mr van duser she had never ventured to cousin that awful personage they had not appeared to be at all angry they were coming to the wedding they would dine with her never in her wildest dreams could she have thought of anything so surprising at six thirty as she carefully wiped down the attic stairs one could never tell where guests might wish to go her mind reverted for a fleeting instant to the white wedding garment of her imaginings it had not emerged from the encircling good and miss philura's eyes wore a wondering troubled expression could it be possible that she had allowed fleshly and carnal desires to carry her away the apostle paul certainly mentioned such sins the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of life she had deliberately avoided certain passages of the pauline epistles in her scripture reading of late how she secretly wondered could the apostle paul understand a woman's heart and a woman's desires he had refused marriage though undeniably he had boasted that he might marry if he wanted to and he had supposed the world was coming to an end in his day it had not come to an end in the pauline epoch for here was miss philura painstakingly removing imaginary dust from the attic stairs and thinking about the white dress which remained inexorably hid from her eyes maybe it was genevieve's dress i was thinking about all the time she told herself with a faint renunciatory sigh i'd rather she have it if there's only one dress there i shan't mind wearing the black and purple brocade perhaps it will be more suitable she presently forgot all about the apostle paul as remotely related to wedding dresses in the fervour of her labours at eight o'clock she had worked her way through the upstairs bedrooms and was just beginning the searching quest for dust along the edges of the front stair carpet when she heard a loud imperative knock at the back door it would be the milkman she concluded with the half pint of milk which to-day must be increased to a quart in view of the guests she had intrepidly undertaken to entertain she hastily opened the door to confront the butter woman this ain't my regular day i know apologized huldah as she deliberately stepped in and deposited a basket on the table <laughs> thinks i maybe she could use an extra fowl seeing as twas her last saturday at home so i just jumped in my wagon and come down the hill miss philura's face was glorified with surprised colour did you know had you heard i was going to have a wedding here to-day she asked a wedding the butter woman's broad smile suddenly faded well i thought didn't you tell me you was going to be married thanksgiving day you said so oh i am to be married thanksgiving day this is my cousin's wedding and so unexpected and his father and mother coming from boston and i invited them to dinner and malvina told me last night genevieve's mother is coming too hmm. got anybody to help you inquired huldah briskly i should think you'd need somebody to take a hold well, malvina's going to do what she can but of course she's busy with genevieve and the butter woman removed her blanket shawl well here i be 
stout and willing just tell me what and i'll whirl in and do it you look all beat out already and i don't believe you've put on an ounce of fat since i was here last land you remind me of a hen i had once i couldn't no more fatten her up than i could flesh up the wind always on the go but i fixed her shut her up in a coop where there wasn't nothing else to take up her mind you ought to have seen her eat the butter woman unrolled a gingham apron and tied it about her substantial waist i kind of thought i could find something to do today she observed complacently i get lonesome up to my house long about this time of the year and i admire to help you out if you say so how'd you like a chicken pie for dinner you bet i can make a good un miss philura breathed a deep sigh of relief the central dish of that particular dinner had lain heavily upon her soul since she had so rashly proffered her hospitality chicken pie with plenty of good rich cream gravy mashed potatoes and boiled onions well, i fetched a few thinking maybe you could use em mm, and what for dessert eh oh, i prepared sponge cake and lemon jelly yesterday twittered miss philura i thought and i'll whip up a pint of cream that'll go all right now i guess i'll put chicken over a gentle simmer like while i scrub up oh, but your horse oh he's blanketed and sound asleep on two legs already i got to run out though and fetch in something from the wagon the something was a flat oblong parcel wrapped in newspaper which Hulda brought in under her apron and deposited on the chair in the corner of the kitchen i don't want you should look at it till after i'm gone she said turning her broad back on miss philura and speaking through the sacrificial smoke of the singeing chicken if i ain't done right you can let me know most any time and there ain't no harm done any fleeting curiosity which miss philura might properly have experienced was speedily swept away by the onrushing flood of events at ten o'clock came in young gregory van duser to unfold to miss philura his plan for renting her cottage don't tell me you've disposed of it already he begged genevieve has set her heart on living here miss philura gazed at him incredulously living here she echoed you can't mean that you would think of why not he urged i've always liked it since since i had that bully little supper with you why didn't you tell me straight off that you knew my darling girl there was a shadow of reproach in his honest eyes i was so taken by surprise murmured miss philura with a propitiatory smile and your dear mother i couldn't think what my duty was just at first you know then mr pettibone came in and you i thought i should like to ask his advice in so serious a matter young gregory smiled upon her almost pityingly so you fancied you would take sides with mother eh oh no my dear surely not i only and what did the minister say he said at once i had no right to keep genevieve from you he thought i should have told you ah oh, bully for silas cried gregory irreverently i'll go to church from now on with the regularity of a haloed saint you'll see miss philura wiped her eyes i am so glad she said quite unaffectedly but the house may we have it just as it is please miss philura hesitated i hadn't thought about renting it she said of course i have lived here all my life and it is a very well-built house but it wants a few repairs i dare say oh yes you'd have to be very careful about emptying the pans on the attic floor every time it rained there are four of them and the oilcloth round the chimney has to be wiped up every day when there's snow on the roof oh, besides well he suggested hopefully i guess we could cope with the roof in one way or another what else miss philura shook her head i'm so used to living here she said gently but i'm afraid you wouldn't know how to shut the side door at night you have to lift it just a little on the hinges before you lock it then there's the, the pantry window 
it has to be stuffed with paper in very cold weather because it's a little loose on one side mm, all right i guess we could get along with the pantry window he said confidently is it a go cousin miss philura's blue eyes wore an introspective look i don't believe you could manage the broken water pipe at the back door the way i do she said i have to be very careful with pails keeping them emptied you know i remember one time i was in boston over three nights and malvina bennett who had promised to attend to it in case of rain quite forgot and when i arrived there was a foot of water in the cellar one could have a new pipe offered gregory you wouldn't mind i suppose i hadn't thought of that oh, but repairs have been quite out of the question you know and one can manage quite nicely if accustomed to a house will you trust us to live in it if we promise to take the best kind of care of everything give you a lease with everything down in black and white rent payable in advance twice a year oh my dear i couldn't think of asking rent of one of my own relatives and cousin caroline always the soul of kindness if you and genevieve could be happy here and it's really a very good house very well built and so comfortable i shall be only too glad to have you here gregory van duser shook his head decidedly couldn't think of it on those terms cousin philura now look here we've got to rent some house and we can't afford to pay much so why not this one you've got a jolly little garden and a hen house i have no chickens she interrupted plaintively and the windows are quite destroyed i fear i was so sure you'd say yes that i brought the lease we want to come back to a home genevieve and i won't you look at it please and sign right here miss philura gazed distractedly at the legal-looking document he spread before her then all in a flutter she reached for her pen but he expostulated you haven't even looked at it never sign your name to anything you don't read carefully first it was a tremulous little signature she affixed after five minutes given to diligent study of the document are you satisfied that we aren't doing you he asked judiciously we want everything shipshape and uh, legal you know with that he took a roll of bills from his pocket and laid it on the table just six months rent please receipt for it cousin and he shoved a form across the table with a strictly business air there now we've got a roof over our heads hooray and he seized the dazed little lady and whirled her about in a mad dance of triumph we'll take care of everything repair when necessary and pay at regular if we don't you can evict us see the terms of the lease was his parting word as he hurried away why oh murmured miss philura with dazzled eyes as she counted the bills then she hugged them to her breast in a rapture of gratitude and to think it had never occurred to me i could rent my house for so much money the encircling good she concluded was filled with kind thoughts travelling from heart to heart and flowering in a beautiful and unexpected way the rest of that surprising day was like its beginning at eleven came a great hamper from the local florist just a few dozen roses ma'am explained the man who brought it and a bit of green for the mantles and such and i'm to fix em if you please at a quarter to twelve arrived mr and mrs j mortimer van duser from boston in their limousine which appeared taxed to its utmost capacity by the boxes and bundles which the footman brought into the house a few wedding gifts for dear gregory and uh, genevieve explained mrs van duser graciously though it was evident that the name of her daughter-in-law-to-be came hard and mr van duser thought as your own wedding was so near we might bring our gifts to you there was no time for the busy little hostess to take a single peep into the boxes marked with her own name for the minister was already coming up the walk and not ten minutes behind him 
came Gregory Van Duser, with the sweetest girl in the world, wrapped in a great furred coat against the cold. Miss Philura caught herself holding her breath with painful intensity as she opened the hospitable old door, hers no longer, to the young couple. And it must be owned that even the puissant Mrs. Van Duser momentarily shrank from the imminent meeting with the girl whom she had last seen standing proud and pale in the shabby front room of the shabby house in East Boston. The girl had won, and Mrs. Van Duser couldn't help stiffening a little after her old awe-inspiring fashion when she greeted Genevieve amid the pink roses and trailing greenery which had transformed Miss Philura's little parlour into a veritable bridal bar. But Mr. J. Mortimer Van Duser! Miss Philura glowed with shame at the sight of the grey cat placidly stroking his whiskers by the fire. How could she have called him Mortimer in a spirit of sinful reprisal? This was a new species of Van Duser, new at least to Miss Philura. This was the John Van Duser who had triumphantly wooed and won Carrie Peabody long ago and afterwards everything else in sight worth having. Few people knew him now. Even his wife had half forgotten that such a genial, tactful, altogether agreeable person existed. It was all over quickly, even the dinner, at which Miss Philura found herself entertaining the whole company. "'Don't you worry a mite,' was the butterwoman's exhortation. "'I've got plenty for all comers.' And that there young feller that come with the ice cream and things is going to wait on table. He says he's used to doing it, and he certainly does take a halt good. It was all a part of the dream. And by this time, Miss Philura had given herself without reserve to the sweeping current of pleasant surprises which appeared to flow out of the invisible, filling all the meagre channels of her life to overflowing. At four o'clock, the butter woman was pinning her heavy shawl about her. Well, I guess I'll be going along, she said. You must be about beat out with all the doings. But want that girl a picture of standing up to be married. I peeked in the door and I seen it all. And the old folks, they was looking at both of them. I had to laugh at that big upstanding lady. She didn't want to cry, but she couldn't no more help it than nothing. Well, I washed up everything. Oh, but maybe I ain't put things in their right places. You can do that when you get rested. No, I'm a-going along. But Miss Philura had seized both the brown hands in her own. Dear Huldah, she said, I couldn't have done it alone. I didn't know they were all going to stay. I hadn't dishes enough, nor spoons and forks. And where did you get those pretty sprigged plates? Oh, them? Uh, oh, the young feller from Boston fetched em. He was a real clever chap, and he said my chicken pie and mashed potatoes went ahead of everything he had ever tasted. His name was Tom. The butter woman opened the door suddenly. I'm glad I come, she said in a curiously smothered voice. I wouldn't have missed it. And if you don't want what's in that box, I'll take it away next time I come. Goodbye, you know. Miss Philura heaved a long sigh of mingled relief and weariness when she found herself once more alone in the little house. There was a scent of roses in the air, and the glamour of romance and happiness still lingered about the quiet rooms, once so sombre and desolate. And then, remembering the butter woman's words, she lifted the oblong parcel which had lain all day on a chair in the kitchen and carried it to the window where the red light of the westering sun streamed in. A stout string secured the newspaper wrappings, and to this was pinned a scrap of paper on which Huldah had written in her cramped handwriting. Miss Philura, ma'am, once I was going to be married, it was to be on Thanksgiving Day, but he got drowned at sea and never came back, so I kept the dress all these years Tom bought it for me in London. If you wear it, I'll be happy. Miss Philura lifted the lid of shining dark wood, all set with buds and leaves of mother-of-pearl, and the imperishable odour of roses long dead 
floated out to mingle with the fragrance of the bridal blooms. Beneath the wrappings of silken tissue lay something softly white, like the petals of chrysanthemums lapping over a heart of gold. Miss Philura touched it with tremulous fingers. Then she took it from the box, and the rich, creamy satin flowed all about her to the floor. And so Malvina Bennett came upon her, unaware, when she quietly opened the door. I just run over to... began Miss Bennett. Then she stopped short with uplifted hands. My, my, your goods is come at last, ain't it? And just in the nick of time. Miss Philura gazed at her old friend through a glorified mist of tears. She was thinking, though she did not tell Malvina so, that her bridal dress was truly a holy garment, since it had been the gift of a pure affection cherished long with love and tears, and at last bestowed wholeheartedly upon herself. Malvina would have been sure to find an omen of ill clinging to the gift of the long-dead bridegroom. But then, Malvina hated to see the moon over her left shoulder, and attributed her chronic rheumatism to a careless observance of the weighty saying, See a pin and pick it up, all the day you'll have good luck. See a pin and leave it lay, bad luck will follow you all the day. Oh, it's the handsomest thing I ever seen in all my life declared Miss Bennett, quite oblivious of the fact that Philura Rice heard not a word of her approving comments. I'll make it up into a perfectly plain princess. It don't need a mite of trimming. End of chapter 14《This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》That same evening, the Reverend Silas Pettibone sat alone in his study. There was belated work to be done on the Sunday sermons, but for once the minister's trained mind refused to obey him. He was thinking with a worried frown that this was the Saturday evening he had specified, in his conversation with Elder Trimmer, as the date on which half the amount of salary must be paid. He recalled his own words with regret, realising that he had acted under the urge of a strong and unwonted impulse. At the time, his course had appeared right and proper, but more than once since, he had experienced uncomfortable qualms of doubt. Should he be compelled to take the matter up in Presbyterial conclave, as he had distinctly threatened to do, what would be the outcome for himself? He was perilously near the deadline, as some zealous advocate of the young man in the pulpit idea has termed fifty years. What if he had taken the bull by the horns, only to be tossed on one side in the struggle? Should he lose his pulpit in Innisfield through any ill-advised effort to collect the arrears in his salary, could he, with his already silvered hair, obtain another? And if he could not... What about his approaching marriage to Miss Philura? The thought of her warmed his chill heart like a cordial. How beautiful she had looked that day, all glorified as she was with the joys of service to others. Not even the youthful bride, in the opinion of the minister, could compare with her. His dismal cogitations gradually assumed a brighter tone. He was not old, he told himself, even at forty-three, the deadline was still in the perspective. And what, after all, was the deadline? He gazed steadily at the hateful phantom, compelling its shrouded shape to shrink and dwindle into a kernel of wholesome truth. A man, and by a man Mr. Pettibone meant a preacher, a man might be dull and platitudinous at twenty-five. He might be spiritually ossified at thirty. At forty, he might even be turning his barrel once a twelvemonth, compelling his congregation to subsist solely upon dry-as-dust dogma, gleaned years before from commentaries and man-made theologies, while at fifty he might be alive, forceful, panoplied with the whole armour of God, 
wielding the sword of the spirit with mighty sinews yes this was the truth avaunt foolish spectre of the dead line never again should it torment him through the silent house rang a sudden peal of the doorbell after a discreet interval he heard the shuffling step of his domestic on her way to answer it then followed a subdued sound of voices mr pettibone arose and opened the door of his study abby stiles sometimes took it upon herself to debar visitors from the ministerial presence more particularly of a saturday evening on this occasion mr pettibone found himself faced with a solemn delegation of five men and for an instant his breath stopped while his heart pounded furiously then with outward composure he ushered elders trimmer puffer and swan and deacons scrimger and twombley into his study carefully closing the door behind them to the manifest discomfiture of miss stiles who scented the unusual in this nocturnal visit if they've come to sass him as is the salt of the earth if ever there was salt i've got my opinion of them miss stiles muttered darkly as she withdrew to her kitchen and him never finding fault with anything since the day i come and me with constant bad luck with my bread what with the yeast souring on me elder trimmer as was right and proper began the conversation amid a tremendous clearing of throats and flourish of sabbath handkerchiefs <clears throat> we called this evening to take up that little matter of our indebtedness to you mr trimmer announced in his best prayer meeting tone the lord has been pleased to crown our efforts with a goodly measure of success he paused dramatically and again the assembled dignitaries broke into what might be termed pious coughing a distinct variety of bronchial weakness peculiar to the sanctuary a goodly measure of success repeated mr trimmer oratorically it um, in short occurred to some of us that at this time of the year when peace on earth good will to men ought to prevail well we should not permit any laxity as it were on the walls of zion we have therefore put our hands to the plough and as a result i have the distinguished pleasure of handing you the whole amount due you to date and um, well a little reminder of affection for our pastor in addition it is in the form of a cheque on our local bank mr pettibone received the envelope which mr trimmer tendered him with a stately inclination of the head he had been revolving some dignified sentences relating to his personal sense of gratitude to deity that his church had been blessed in this as in other particulars but when he tried to utter these appropriate platitudes his voice quite unexpectedly failed him and he grasped the hands outstretched to meet his from all sides without a word it was deacon scrimger who finally voiced the general feeling when he said in his high nasal tones you ain't no better pleased to get it and we be to give it dominey i guess we was getting kind of dead in trespasses and sins but you roused us up just in time praise the lord so once again was a mountain removed and cast into the sea by that potent instrumentality known as faith this time assuredly of the mustard seed variety end of chapter 15 chapter 16 of miss philura's wedding gown by florence morse kingsley this librivox recording is in the public domain it was exactly two weeks from the following thursday when the ladies aid and missionary society met at the parsonage for the purpose of sewing a new carpet for the pastor's study painters and paper hangers had been at work in the house during the minister's absence and the dingy rooms had taken on a look of brightness and cleanliness pleasing to the eye abby stiles with her head swathed in a towel against dusts and draughts was busy putting things to rights in view of the homecoming of mr and mrs pettibone 
Yes, Miss Buckthorn, stated Miss Stiles. I'm going to stay right on, for a spell anyhow, till she gets kind of broke to harness. Mrs. Buckthorn paused in the act of unrolling the long breadths of carpet to gaze darkly at Electa Pratt, who was assisting her. A hired girl, this excellent lady murmured. Well, I never. I shouldn't think Mrs. Pettibone could afford it, especially now that he's married. Miss Pratt giggled girlishly. Oh, I guess he can afford most anything now, was her opinion. All Flora has to do is hold the thought. If that ain't unchristian, opined Mrs. Buckthorn, I don't know what is. I guess the Lord of Hosts knows what is good for Flora Rice without any of her meddling. Mrs. Puffer, a softly round and rosy matron, approached with a skein of carpet thread. Oh, my, wasn't she lovely? I never saw such a sweet dress. Satin as thick as cream, chimed in Sadie Buckthorn, waxing a length of thread vigorously. Sadie Buckthorn was slim and rosy and eighteen. Her brown eyes sparkled defiantly as she spoke. I think Miss Fleura is just perfectly sweet, she declared, but I never can get used to calling her Mrs. Pettibone. Well, I didn't see none of it, sighed a sallow-faced woman in a black dress. I couldn't get out and know how Thanksgiving Day. My husband's mother was visiting us and... She was took with one of her spells, just as I was putting on my rubbers to go. It was just my luck. <sighs> Mrs. Salter sighed heavily as she spoke. Her luck, as she called it, always appeared to intervene between herself and any cherished purpose. But of course you've heard all about it, haven't you? asked Mrs. Puffer. Mrs. Salter shook her head sadly. There ain't been a soul near me since to tell me anything. As I said to Mother Salter this morning, if I don't break my leg on the ice this afternoon, I says, maybe I'll get out to the ladies' aid and hear the news. And I did come near slipping down right in front of the house. I'm always so unlucky. I'll tell you about the wedding, volunteered Sadie Buckthorn eagerly. She glanced about the circle of industrious women with an imperious toss of her dark head. In the first place, she began, the church was full, even the gallery, and it looked dandy. The helping hand circle had trimmed it with evergreen, and right down in front of the pulpit was a big gilt horn of plenty, full of all sorts of fruit and vegetables. Oh, was that what it was meant for? put in Miss Pratt with sly malice. I couldn't imagine. I thought perhaps it was another collection for the pastor. The girl reached for more thread. She longed to say something sharp and clever and scathing, but at the moment she could think of nothing. So she merely tilted up her pink chin aggressively at Miss Pratt. It was a horn of plenty, she said positively, whether you or anybody else recognised it. It means abundance, plenty of everything good and rich and nice. I'm sure we all hope they'll be blessed observed Mrs. Salter plaintively, whereat two or three of the older women wiped their eyes. There was plenty of sermon anyway, pursued the lively Miss Buckthorn. The minister from Newton preached, and we girls thought he'd never stop. Daughter, intoned Mrs. Buckthorn majestically, wagging a warning finger. Well, it was awfully long, and Miss Philura sitting there in the pew all that while waiting. Did you notice the cloak she had on? asked Mrs. Scrimger from the opposite side of the room. A babel of tongues uprose, and the anxious Mrs. Salter gathered with difficulty that Miss Philura's bridal gown had been concealed from the view of the congregation till the last minute by a sumptuous fur-lined garment. It was Miss Bennett, who had just entered, who added authoritatively that the cloak in question was the gift of Genevieve's Ma and Pa from Boston, and it cost a hundred dollars if it cost a cent. The little dressmaker had of a sudden become a person of distinction in Innisfield. 
from the pinnacle of her greatness she cast a look of complacent superiority about the circle of workers you're puckering that there seam miss puffer she observed rebukingly here just you let me take hold nobody even glanced in the direction of sadie buckthorn who was humming the immortal strains of the wedding march from lohengrin i can just tell you ladies my heart was in my mouth when they come to stand up to be married declared miss malvina oh, thinks i if that there waist wrinkles in the back i'll feel like shutting up my shop for good and all she paused a dangling length of carpet thread in one hand the better to enjoy the unwonted sensation of being the observed of all observers tain't no easy job to make a real good heavy piece of satin lay just so but land i needn't a worried it fitted her like a duck's foot in the mud there was quiet in the room for a full minute after miss bennett's last remark while flashing needles flew in and out and the soft staccato phrases of the wedding march roused a reminiscent tenderness in each matronly breast then sadie buckthorn spoke softly as if still gazing at a never-to-be-forgotten vision of exquisite happiness miss philura's wedding gown was like her she said and she seemed like oh a lovely angel just dressed for heaven daughter murmured mrs buckthorn with a pious upward glance End of chapter 16 End of Miss Filiora's Wedding Gown by Florence Morse Kingsley